Yes, t uh, tonight we're going to be sp speaking about the last things, heaven, hell, uh, purgatory, uh, judgment. Uh, also, I'm going to touch a little bit on indulgences as they relate to uh, the Catholic Church's teaching on purgatory, and obviously there's some controversial aspects about indulgences that we'll cover as well. But uh, Pope Benedict the Twelfth, the current Pope Benedict is the sixteenth, um, teaches by his apostolic authority that the Christian who unites his own death to that of Jesus views it as a step towards Jesus and entrance into heaven. Death puts an end to human life as the time open to either accepting or rejecting the divine grace manifested in Jesus Christ. So that tells us that this, our earthly life, from the moment that we're conceived until the day the Lord calls us uh, to judgment, uh, is the time in which we are invited to respond to the real presence of Christ in the world, in human history, and in our own personal lives. And death brings that opportunity for responding to God's grace to a conclusion. So the New Testament speaks of judgment primarily in its aspect of the final encounter that we have with Christ uh, in his second coming. So we also believe that not only will we have a personal private judgment at our own private death, but we also believe that the Lord is going to come at the end of time to conclude include human history and to judge the living and the dead and to judge the world not just the individuals of the world but the whole ethos of human history but we also will be rewarded immediately at our private death or our personal death in accordance with our works and our faith each person receives his eternal retribution in his immortal soul at the very moment of his death in a particular judgment that refers his life uh, to Christ, either into the blessedness of heaven through purification or immediately, or immediate and everlasting damnation. Now, does anybody have any question on any of that? Am I real clear on, on what I just said there? Um, that at our particular death, at our own death, we will have a particular judgment, and we will receive in our immortal soul, at the very moment of death, a particular judgment that will refer our whole life to Christ and whether that life has been configured to Christ or configured to the evil one, to sin, to death. Um, and the, after that judgment, we will either go, the immortal soul, will either go to the blessedness of heaven through a purification, or you can go immediately, if you don't need a purification, uh, or to everlasting damnation. Okay? So the Catholic Church believes in a personal judgment at the moment of death, where your life is referred to Christ, and depending upon which direction your life has been going throughout your life, you will either enter the blessedness of heaven through a purification, or immediately, or you will continue on the path that you have chosen in this life, which was opposed to Christ, into eternal damnation. Now, some people picture heaven as a purely spiritual realm, a form of existence. It is more appropriate, however, to understand heaven in a more tangible way. And I think that that's the purpose of the sacraments of the church, where we experience the risen Christ, and thus heaven, his kingdom, in a very tangible way through water and uh, oil and bread and wine and the laying on of hands and, and the beauty of our churches, the, the visual imagery of incense uh, rising before God as a pleasing fragrance. All of that is meant to uh, put us in a tangible way in touch with uh, the ultimate reality of what heaven is like. So heaven is a definite place, if you will, or existence, where not only God is, but there are angels. And it is also where Christ is in his sacred humanity and Our Lady with her human body. There, too, all the blessed will dwell with their glorified bodies after the last judgment, the second coming. Therefore, heaven, by its very nature, must be conformable to those who abide in it. So if the Blessed Mother, 
Our Lady has her human body in heaven through the assumption. If the risen Lord has his glorified body, according to which our bodies at the resurrection of the dead will be patterned, then heaven must be an existence that is capable of containing the physical. Okay? After the last judgment, the saints will behold heaven with their bodily eyes. Therefore, it is a visible kingdom. Uh, and Mary, as I mentioned, already experiences that through her assumption. So she already has the fullness of redemption or, or the, the experience of her body uh, in heaven. So what would you say are some of the images of heaven that you've kind of developed over the years? Anybody have any particular ideas of what heaven is going to be like or what you hope it will be like? Anybody? Nobody? Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes. That, that heaven is primarily a community. Uh, and I think that's what this is getting across, that, that it's, it's, first of all, the community of the Most Holy Trinity, uh, and then secondly, the community of the angels and archangels, the choirs of angels, and then uh, finally, the community of those redeemed, uh, so that there will be an experience of others there. Uh, now, some people would say, well, all I need is God, and that's true, but God needs us or wants us and loves us, so I think he will understand that, that um, the unity that we have with loved ones and tracing our ancestry back and, uh, it will be a very uh, unique aspect of heaven. Anybody else? That's what I, I, I hadn't been able to understand why you call it heaven when you, really, when you think in yourself, I'll see my daddy, mm -hmm. you know, that's, see mom, I'll see, see all of them. And they say, no, you don't know anybody. Well, that's what some people do say, and I'm not sure exactly why they say that or where that comes from. I think that's part of, of a Protestant uh, outlook on heaven. You that, you know yeah. Where do you want to go if you know and right. you don't know? Right. And that's why the Catholic Church emphasizes the communion of saints and getting to know the saints that are there, because we're going to know them up there. Uh, and, but anybody that's in heaven is a saint. So we will know them, and we will know the ones that are our loved ones, uh, especially. And there will be a reunion there. So that's true. I believe that, but that's, mm -hmm. well, it, you've been around dying people. And uh, you know how they, they reach out their hand. And my mama, she reached out, and she said, they is hot, though. Mm -hmm. now, many people that I minister to who are close to death start speaking to dead relatives. And she was not. Yeah. She yeah. Was, she was not in touch with us. Mm -hmm. Right. She right. was not out of her. We reached out and said, so they had mm -hmm. kids. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, she said, and there's Pat. She was one of her favorite mm -hmm. cousins. Mm -hmm. But she mm -hmm. was talking and she was already, already dying. So she, they, and she was a good woman. She, I know she was mm -hmm. going to heaven. So mm -hmm. they, they got to know. I know. They, they have a sense. You're right. Well, someone has once said that while we do not know the material structure of heaven, God has made it so, so beautiful and so glorious that the saints will never tire of the contemplation of its splendors to all eternity. So you'll never get tired of heaven because we're going to be there forever. So, so God has constructed it in a way uh, that we will not uh, grow tired of it. Speaking of herself, St. Teresa of Avila uh, says of a private revelation that she had that the Blessed Mother of God gave me a jewel and hung around my neck a suburb golden chain to which a cross of priceless value was attached. Both the gold and the precious stones thus given to me are so unlike those which we have here in this world that no comparison can be made between them. They are beautiful beyond anything that can be conceived, and the material where they are composed is beyond our knowledge. For what we call gold and precious stones, besides those in heaven, appear dark and lusterless as charcoal. St. Augustine, St. Anselm, and many other saints do not hesitate to maintain that there are in heaven real trees, real fruits, real flowers, um, 
that are very deliciously good and attractive and delightful to the sight, taste, smell, and touch, and different from anything that we can imagine. So there is a belief that that in heaven you'll be eating, you'll be seeing, you'll be hearing, you'll be smelling, you'll be doing all of the things that, that we only experience here in a in a, a somewhat of a, a, um, a corrupted way because of sin and death and all the rest of that. In heaven, we won't be encumbered by any of that, so we'll see the beauty of things for what they really are. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states that this perfect life with the Most Holy Trinity, this communion of life and love with the Trinity, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, the angels and all the blessed or all the saints, is the ultimate end and fulfillment of the deepest human longings, the state of supreme, definite happiness. To live in heaven is to be with Christ. The elect live in Christ, but they retain or rather find their true identity and their own name. Okay? So in Christ we find out who we truly are, and, and the distinctiveness that we have as um, uh, created in the image and likeness of God. However, it is not until the last judgment that we will have bodies in heaven, um, except for the Blessed Mother. But at the last day, we will have them again, and those bodies will be so beauteous that nothing in the world can compare with them. Um, so what kind of a body do you want? <laughs> you know, so. But in heaven, we will appreciate beauty uh, from a, an aesthetic point of view. There won't be any lust or, or corruption of thought. Uh, uh, we will be viewing each other as, as brothers and sisters, uh, and, and that uh, there just won't be anything untoward about heaven, even in terms of the extreme beauty that we will be seeing. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, in a private revelation to St. Bridget, the Blessed Mother said, the, sta the saints stand around my son like countless stars, whose glory is not to be compared with any temporal light. Believe me, if the saints could be seen shining with the glory they now possess, no human eye could endure their, their, their sight, their light. All would turn away dazzled and blinded, some authors also say that the glorified body will have four attributes, our glorified body at the, at the second coming or at the final judgment. It will be beautiful, number one. It will be impassable, meaning the glorified body will be able, will be incapable of suffering. It will never be sick or infirmed. It will not grow old or unsightly, thank God. Uh, <laughs> Thirdly, the glorified body will have agility. The glorified body will be able to traverse the greatest distance with the speed of thought. And the glorified body will be subtle, supple. Uh, the faculty of uh, penetrating all matter, of passing in and out, wheresoever it will. We will also experience pleasure and gratification by means of the five senses. Sight, number one. The power of sight will be so perfect that nothing uh, can be hid from our eyes. We will see what, it, what is distant as distinctly as what is near. The greatest sight, of course, will be seeing God face to face in the risen body of Jesus Christ. Our hearing. We will be able to hear the canticles of the angels and the soft music of their harps. The nine choirs of angels will sing the praise of God, and we will listen to it. Smell. The delicious odors of paradise surpass anything we can imagine. Uh, taste. The saints will taste um, a sweet substance, or, or a sweet sustenance, which will satisfy them. Touch. St. Anselm says, in the future life, the saints will experience a feeling of untold comfort and ease. The pleasurable sensation will pervade every member, producing a wondrous sense of peace and contentment. How many of you all want to go to heaven? <laughs> Who doesn't want to go to heaven? <laughs> okay. I mean, this is, this is good stuff. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and it's... it's and, and what, I'm, what, what these saints that I'm quoting are describing is 
the human body totally redeemed um, by God. Thus, sight, smell, taste, uh, touch, uh, hearing are, are totally redeemed. Uh, so that's what, what heaven is all about. The saints will take very great pleasure in beholding one another, in conversing with one another. So they speak, too. Uh, they are united by a bond of mutual charity. Each one will be able to see into the other's heart and know how great is the affection he feels from him. Now, could you imagine if right now each of us could look into each other's heart to figure out how you feel about the person looking at you? Wouldn't that strike fear <laughs> into you? <laughs> you know. <laughs> But in heaven we're redeemed, so there's not going to be anything evil whatsoever. Uh, so that's the thing that we have to really get accustomed to, that in, on this side of the second coming, or this side of heaven, we're corrupted, so to speak. Uh, so we don't want anybody to be able to read our minds or our hearts, because sometimes what is there is not good. But in heaven, that's redeemed, and we have nothing to fear in that regard. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Our Father who art in heaven. The biblical expression of heaven is, is a way of being. Um, it does not mean that God is distant, but majestic. Our Father is not elsewhere, He is here. It is precisely because God is three times holy, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that He is close to the humble and the contrite of heart. Our Father's house is our homeland our promised land, if you will. Sin has exiled us from the land of the covenant, but conversion of heart enables us to return to our Father in heaven. In Christ, uh, heaven and earth are reconciled, for Jesus the Son alone descended from heaven and causes us to ascend with him by his cross, resurrection, and ascension. So when the church prays the Our Father who art in heaven, she is professing that we are the people of God already seated with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ and hidden with Christ in God. Yet at the same time, here indeed we groan and long to put on our heavenly dwelling. Christians are in the flesh but do not live according to the flesh. They spend their lives on earth but are citizens of heaven. So that's kind of a description of, of what heaven is. Uh, and I think it's a, what, what we should think about is heaven being a place of complete redemption of not only of who we are in terms of our soul, but also of our, our bodies when, when they are given back to us at the end of time, and uh, also what the world will be like. Now, this will get into some philosophical uh, uh, things that maybe you don't want to, don't want to think about, that, that you don't normally think about. The Catholic Church believes that redemption, um, the work of Christ, is complete. He is victorious over Satan. And that judgment has already occurred. Okay? And we are just in the final days of, of being raptured, if you will, to our uh, particular judgment and the final consummation of the world. So in a sense, because eternity is timeless, what I've just described has already occurred for people in terms of, of even the, the resurrection of the body, okay? Because there's not, it's not like heaven is, uh, heaven is always. You know, what we, when, you know, how did God reveal himself in the Old Testament? He said, I am. He doesn't say I was or I will be, I am. So heaven is. Does that make sense? But on this side of the second coming, we're still caught up in a time warp, if you will. Uh, but in heaven, there is no time warp. Okay? Now, that's pretty hard to comprehend. But, for example, when God chose the Blessed Mother from all eternity to be the mother of his son, even long before she was conceived herself, she was chosen. She was. Does that make sense? And each person that is to be conceived is, each, e e everyone to be conceived is uh, the reason why Jesus came, 
to suffer and die for everyone. So in a sense, we can say that the second coming really won't occur if, until the last person to be saved is conceived. When will that be? Only God knows. Uh, but that's on this side where we're in a, a, a time warp, if you will, but in heaven, it's all finished. And, uh, you know, when you die, uh, from the moment you die and open your eyes in heaven, in terms of of human years, that could be uh, a billion years, you know, but to us it will be instantly. Uh, so, so, so I think that's something for us to think about as well. So, what is the Christian belief about death? A Christian believes that there is eternal life after death, heaven or hell, as I've just talked about, and that the soul is immortal. Okay, so there was a, a time, even in my seminary training, where we were told that the soul is not immortal, that it's only alive because of God. Well, that's true. Uh, and then we were told that hell was the death of the soul. So hell was nothingness. But that's not really classical Catholic teaching. We believe that the soul is eternal because God has thus made it so, and therefore if it is eternal or immortal, it cannot die. So at the moment of death of the body, the soul is before God for the particular judgment, and as I mentioned, uh, depending on how that judgment goes, one either enters into heaven immediately or through a purification process, or they are condemned to hell because they've condemned themselves. Christ shares with all Christians a hope for a new life in heaven, salvation. And this occurs through the Christ event, which begins with his uh, incarnation at the moment of his conception in the womb of the Blessed Mother by the power of the Holy Spirit, all the way through his resurrection, ascension to heaven, and giving of the Holy Spirit, and now in the sacraments of the church. Faith in Jesus Christ and in his church are necessary as well. And we must be free of unrepentant mortal sin. That is, we must be forgiven to, in order to enter into heaven. So, Heaven is only for those who are repentant. Um, um, you cannot get into heaven unrepentant. Okay, So our whole life should be a, a life of, of seeking God's forgiveness and of repenting of our sins and striving to be always in a state of repentance. That's why my dad used to tell me when I was a small child, go before, before you go to sleep at night, say your act of contrition because you don't know if you're going to wake up in the morning. The Lord could call you in the middle of the night. So be repentant even when you go to bed at night. And isn't sleep kind of a metaphor for death? So before you fall asleep, you want to say your act of contrition. Examine the day and tell God you're sorry. And certainly God will honor a repentant heart. Faith in the resurrection does not take away our need to grieve, uh, and, and that's an important thing. I used to think, well, you know, you're, you're loved, you, you, know, you experience a horrible death of a loved one, and, and, you know, just because we believe that possibly they're in heaven doesn't mean that we're not going to grieve. That's part of not being fully redeemed ourselves yet, not in heaven, that we're going to grieve when those we love are no longer with us. Uh, that's just a, a normal thing. Um, so we, we should be aware of that. But at the moment of the pa of passage from this life to the next, our time for gaining or losing merit has ended. There's no second chance once you die. Either a person is in a state of grace or in a state of unrepentant mortal sin. No repentance or forgiveness uh, can occur after you die. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so that, we'll talk about purgatory in a, in a minute because purgatory is not about a second chance for those who, for whatever reason, were never repentant. Uh, purgatory is purification of repentant and forgiven sinners. So, now, what is the Catholic Church's teaching concerning the taking of life? Catholics, along with all those who profess faith in God, believe that God is the master of all life from conception until our natural death. This has implications for abortion, euthanasia, suicide, as well as the death penalty. Occasion, occasions exist when a person 
has a right to legitimate self-defense. Uh, and also, so if somebody's attacking you with a gun or trying to break into your house, you have the right to self-defense. Or if our country is in a war and it's considered a just war, you have a right to defend your country uh, uh, by going to war. Governments have the right to impose penalties on unjust aggressors for the preservation of public order and the safety of others. Um, and setting up prisons and all the rest of that. But no one has the right to commit suicide. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. The church has always understood that suicide in general, in principle, is a mortal sin. And the unfortunate thing about committing suicide is that you don't have the opportunity to repent because you've killed yourself. Uh, unless you have a long dying process where you can, you, a priest comes and all the rest of that. <clears throat> but the question is, what is a mortal sin? Well, serious matter. Is, is suicide a serious matter? Okay. Uh, you have to have knowledge that it's a mortal sin. Most of us in here believe or know that suicide is a mortal sin. So you have the knowledge. But the third one is full consent of the will. So it's there that the church recognizes that people who commit suicide sometimes lack the discretion of the full consent of the will. And therefore, it would not be considered a mortal sin. Okay? But in principle, we would say that suicide is a mortal sin. But for something to be a mortal sin, those three things have to be present. Serious matter, which suicide is. Knowledge that it's wrong, which all of us know and full consent of the will. So if you have a mental illness, you're in a great depression uh, or whatever, uh, or you do something on the spur of the moment that you probably would regret if, uh, if you'd only given yourself some time, uh, those would not be, uh, that would then disqualify that particular suicide as a mortal sin. So God would ha have mercy <coughs> on the sinner and allow them to enter into heaven. Um, no one, um, assisted suicide and euthanasia are against, uh, the law of God as well. It is morally acceptable, though, to discontinue procedures considered extraordinary or disp disproportionate, uh, to the outcome of saving someone's life. So, let's say that you have a terminal illness, uh, and the doctor says, you know, possibly you have six months to live, and we're down to a month and you need a respirator and the respirator will help you to live another year but you're gonna die anyway do you have to use the respirator to keep the person alive for another year no no now you could morally choose to do that correct uh, but then you have to look at the resources that are being spent and all of that and is that moral and and all of the uh, you know so so the church does allow people to die with dignity uh, and you don't have to do extraordinary things to keep people alive um, but you do have to give them what is normal, what is ordinary, such as hydration or fluids, uh, food if possible, and certainly uh, uh, proper care. Yes? Yeah, it, it, it's, this is a moving target just in the sense of uh, what is extraordinary. And today we'd still say that, but then I think of uh, uh, Superman being on a respirator and going around and talking to people and, you know... And but he was in terminal, though, uh, technically, no, right. No, but, but uh, for the most part, people do tend to think, uh, and, and moral theologians, that a respirator, uh, even, even if you're not terminal necessarily, for light long, could be considered extraordinary. But it is a moving target. It's something right. the church could change its teaching. On. Right, right. <laughs> Uh, now, finally, human beings do have the right to kill animals for food or for some other good reason. And euthanasia for animals uh, is acceptable, um, but suicide is not acceptable in animals. <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs> okay. Now, the most controversial class I had uh, two or three years ago was do animals go to heaven? Okay. <laughs> this was very controversial. <laughs> um, 
technically, from the biblical point of view and church tradition, we cannot say uh, that ha animals uh, uh, go to heaven when they die. Um, but the church doesn't say that they don't go to heaven. Okay, so there's no teaching that says absolutely not. Uh, so we do believe that God in his goodness will provide for our total happiness in heaven. He should be sufficient, but if not, he will provide <laughs> other, other uh, uh, companions, so to speak, uh, to help you on that journey of eternity and of being uh, happy in heaven. So, so it is quite possible, since the whole order of creation is redeemed by the Christ event, that even uh, cockroaches and <laughs> snakes, water moccasins, uh, all the rest of those <laughs> will be in heaven. And you won't mind a little roach crawling up your leg in the middle of the night. Okay, yes. <laughs> Dinosaurs, who knows? They may be there too. Jurassic Park, we don't know. Uh, you know, all of that could be present. But we won't be offended by them. But also, keep in mind the Old Testament uh, passages at Isaiah about the child playing by the adder's den and, and the lion and the lamb uh, sitting down and all together. And that's kind of an image of, of the promised land of heaven. So we, we don't know. Uh, uh, it's quite possible that our pets that are our beloved pets, um, are in heaven. When I was a child, we had a, a gosh, in 1960, we bought a, a, a Chinese pug. And back then, they were not a popular breed of animal. Nobody had ever seen them, hardly. And uh, people thought they were just the most, he was the most ugly dog in the world. And uh, you know what pugs are now. They're very popular now, I don't know why, but uh, back then they were not. And uh, <clears throat> this pug lived to be 17 years old. So. Uh, so if I was six when we got him, I was 22 when he died. But I think it, when I turned seven, I baptized that dog. So he's going to be in heaven, you know. <laughs> so, I just know that dog's in heaven. He has to be, okay. <laughs> I didn't give him the last rites. <laughs> My father took him and euthanized him without me knowing. Okay. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but anyway, we don't know uh, uh, if they're there or not. Heaven, as I said, could be understood as a place, but certainly it is a state of existence. And, and it's not just ethereal and spiritual. There has to be tangible elements there. If the physical uh, assumed body of the Blessed Virgin Mary is there, as well as the physical glorified body of the risen Christ. Um, so that's heaven. What is hell? Hell is a state of eternal rejection of God, which begins in the here and now. So let me make that clear. It's, it's the direction of a person's life. Uh, and it is a total rejection of God, of his son, and the grace that he makes available to us. And that begins in the here and now. Okay? But it has to be based upon the three criteria. Uh, knowledge of how serious that is, okay, well, so it's serious, obviously, uh, uh, and knowledge that it's serious, and full consent of the will, okay? So if one is participating in a lifestyle that is anti-Christ, anti-Christian, anti-God, and one knows better, one is held liable to judgment in that regard. And one uh, uh, could, in fact, uh, be in a state of total rejection of God at their personal judgment and will not enter heaven. They will uh, not pass, go, or collect $200. They will go straight to hell. Okay? Yes? Well, in that light, uh, being excommunicated, in that the church doesn't really excommunicate people, the church recognizes that somebody has <coughs> left the church. And judgment is a recognition that the person has left Christ. Correct, correct. Now, in terms of excommunication, we would say that whatever the, the issue was, excommunication is meant to be a grace, actually, uh, to uh, motivate the person to repent and return to the full communion of the church. Because if you're not in the full communion of the church, that's a metaphor for not being in full communion with God. And if you're not in full communion with God, how can you be saved? Okay, so we should be aware of that. Okay. Um, hell consists... In a deep, uh, I should, let me start over. Hell consists in a state of deep 
burning loneliness or alienation from God that we have chosen in this life and have not regretted or repented. Okay? It's very important. Hatred is central to hell. Hatred of self and of others and of total self-absorption and selfishness. Okay? I used to uh, uh, use a story occasionally in the homilies uh, of, of, of this particular image uh, of what hell is. St. Peter is taking a person who isn't sure about heaven and hell and uh, trying to teach them what it is and he brings them first of all to this great big banquet room and it is the most beautiful room that your eyes have ever beheld and the table is beautifully set and there's beautiful china and crystal and the most sumptuous and delicious food available uh, and and then he takes them to uh, hell, and it's the identical place. Uh, it's this beautiful banquet hall with gold on the walls and uh, table finely set, the best china and crystal, the most delicious food as possible. Then he brings them back to, to heaven, to the banquet there, and the people come in and they come in and uh, sit down uh, at, at uh, their table. But the man has noticed that both in heaven and hell, the silverware is um, about four feet long, the knives, the forks, and the spoons, both in heaven and in hell. In heaven, what the people do is uh, take their fork and reach over to the plate that is across from them and the person, and they feed each other. Okay? In hell, the person is trying to use the utensil and can't get the food to their mouth and it keeps falling over their back and they're in terrible frustration and anger. The difference being that in heaven, you love each other and you look after the person that is near you. In hell, you just think about yourself. Uh, and they didn't even think that maybe they could feed the other person. So that's kind of, uh, uh, kind of a metaphor for what hell, hell is and, and the hatred myths, the, the self-absorption. Um, and, and hell is the only place that can contain that kind of, uh, of existence. But the people there are suffering, but, but this is what they want. They've chosen it to begin with, and it's completed at their personal judgment. So now... The church has used a lot of other metaphors to describe hell. That's, I think the one that I just said is, is kind of a merciful understanding of hell. Um, other images of hell would be the burning, fire, demons, uh, uh, just the most horrible things imaginable. But I think that's to get across to us the tragedy of separating ourselves from God uh, and for eternity. What that will be, you know, somehow in my own mind I keep thinking, well, we're allowing them to continue, or God is, not we, God is allowing them to continue on a path that they have consciously chosen for eternity. And within them there is no desire for God. So that's what hell is, okay? And there's no possibility of redemption in hell. So the person is, is, is where that person wants to be. What is purgatory? Purgatory consists in the therapeutically painful passage from this life into God's loving presence. We receive the punishment we deserve for our forgiven sins to make satisfaction. It is related to the penance that we are given in confession. Um, so, for example, I've used this uh, metaphor. Let's say that in a, fate of, uh, in a fit of rage tonight, because somebody's not paying attention to what I'm saying, uh, I, I go up to you and I rip your arm out of your sock, arm socket and I beat you unconscious with it, okay? And then I run out of the, 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 uh, this hall in a fit of, of anguish and upset. Um, okay. So you're, you know, hopefully 
your brothers and sisters in here will call 911 <laughs> and, and uh, get you to the hospital. Uh, and you'll be in intensive care for a long time. Your arm will not be able to be reattached because I've taken it with me. <laughs> and you can't find me. Okay. And uh, so, and, um, um, but eventually you do recover. Okay. And eventually, after my arrest and imprisonment, uh, I repent of my sin, I go to confession, and I go and also seek uh, to beg your forgiveness for having ripped your arm out of your, your arm socket and beat you over the head with it until you were in, unconscious and then threw it in a dumpster where I can't remember. Um, and you forgive me, okay? So I've been forgiven by the church and I've been forgiven by you, and I do my penance, which is prison time, uh, but my forgiven sin still affects you, correct? Because you're now one arm, and I took your, the arm that you write with uh, and eat with. So you're, you're, you're using the, the arm that was not good, your dominant arm. So my forgiven sin still affects you while you're still living, correct? So purgatory makes satisfaction uh, in, in that process of, of being purified uh, for forgiven sin, if it's necessary, okay? Now, it's quite possible that the good Lord will say, well, uh, Father McDonald did 50 years in prison. He did seek to go to confession. He did seek to be reconciled with the person, and he uh, paid restitution, okay, to the person. Uh, so perhaps what I did in this life in that regard would be the sufficient penance, okay, and in addition to that, I may have gained some indulgences that would have wiped out any need for purgatory of this sin, for this sin. Uh, and I'll talk about that more specifically in a minute. So, so, so purgatory really is a, a place where justice is meted out to the person who is forgiven, depending on the nature of the forgiven sin and the pain and suffering that it has caused others. Does that make sense? Okay. How long that takes, we don't know. Again, in heaven, there is not time as we understand it here. So, in a sense, it could be a blink of the eye for us, or it could be a billion years for us. We don't know, because heaven doesn't have time. Um, the other aspect of this purification that takes place at the moment of death is, right now, I would say that I'm in a state of, of grace. I, I don't think I'm in a state of mortal sin, as far as I know. Well, I can't. If I don't know, then I wouldn't be. But, but, anyway, uh, but anyway, let's say that if I were to die tonight, if I find myself in heaven tomorrow, something has got to change within who I am as a person because right now I can get angry. I can still harbor some grudges against people. There might be people in my past that I'm not completely reconciled with. Uh, I haven't forgiven totally. Or perhaps they haven't forgiven me. And uh, so if I'm in heaven, all that has to have changed. My attitude about other people, any re residual evil that might be in my heart, will have been taken away at my personal judgment if I'm in heaven. So something occurs. So, so even if we can't say that we can find purgatory specifically, the word purgatory or what I'm describing specifically in the New Testament, uh, we do believe that we are being tried by fire and purified like gold in the furnace. And that occurs in this life, and there's no reason to think that it wouldn't occur at also in the process of dying and in our own uh, personal judgment. And also, we could say the dying process, if it's lengthy for a person, could be viewed as a purification and uh, a, a punishment, if you will, for uh, whatever forgiven sins that did not have the appropriate uh, punishment. Um, indulgences reduce the need for purgatory or eliminates it altogether. And indulgences are gifts from the church based upon the authority that Jesus gave the apostles, and thus the bishops of the church, including the pope, the ability to loose and bind. Whatever you declare on earth will be uh, whatever you bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Binding and loosing. So uh, an indulgence, there are two kinds. Okay. 
that are, are again gifts from the church. The first kind is a partial indulgence. And the next one is a uh, um, plenary indulgence. I guess I spelled that right. Um, I don't have spell check on this board. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so um, the church believes in purgatory. Okay, and it's the dogma of the church. It's not just a, a fanciful theological notion. But the church also recognizes that she can give gifts that, uh, uh, to the faithful uh, to kind of allow whatever punishment that is due after death for forgiven sins to eliminate the need for that punishment or that purification. Um, and usually they're in the form of a prayer that you say. So, for example, there are a variety of indulgences, and you'd have to get the book. Uh, there is a, a book that tells you how you get them and what are the occasions for them and how you would receive them. But, for example, on Fridays of Lent, when we pray the Stations of the Cross as a community, if at the end of the Stations of the Cross you kneel down and say a prayer, there's a formal prayer before the crucifix, before our Lord crucified, and in addition to that, pray for the intentions of the Pope, and only that's in Our Father, Hail Mary, and the Glory Be. And then within a week's period, go to confession and receive Holy Communion worthily. You gain a plenary indulgence, which you can apply to yourself or to someone who is in purgatory. You can't apply it to another living person here on earth, but you can apply it to yourself or to a, a person in purgatory. And therefore, the plenary indulgence uh, granted to a specific person would remove the need for, uh, would get them out of purgatory if they're there. Um, or it, up until that point in your life, you would not, if you were to die instantly, you would go to heaven instantly. Okay? Does everybody understand that? Okay. Now, yes? Not necessarily, because if you die after receiving an indulgence, you wouldn't have to. But, but still, though, at, the, at your personal judgment, some kind of a purification in the positive sense occurs that makes you perfect. Okay? So, so I would say that purgatory has two aspects to it, being made perfect, first of all, but also the punishment aspect. So we're, in terms of an indulgence, we're, we're speaking of the punishment aspect being uh, eliminated. Well, how does this apply to saints? To saints? What do you mean? In terms of, do they go to purgatory? Yeah, oh, it's quite possible that the saints that are in heaven could have experienced purgatory. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, uh, a saint, anybody that's in heaven is a saint. The church proclaims some people to be in heaven, uh, but we don't make them be in heaven. They got there by God's grace. Uh, but we're just acclimating what's there. Okay. So, so being declared a saint, the church is just saying. Those are individuals know are heaven. heaven. But they could have gone through purgatory, for all we know. We know that they're no longer in purgatory, okay, once they're declared a saint. Because there's a miracle. That, that's correct, correct, correct. But the, so a saint could have been a very uh, evil person at one point in their life, but they repented of it. They lay, after that repentance, they lived saintly lives here on earth. And then whatever punishment was due their unforgiven sin, they would have experienced uh, unless they had an indulgence and then uh, they're in heaven. Now, all of this has to be done freely. What Martin, Martin Luther, who began the Protestant Reformation and one of his biggest complaints against the Catholic Church at that time was not indulgences but some aspect of indulgences. Does anybody know what that was? Se the sale of them and buying them. Okay, the trafficking in indulgences. And that was a very corrupt and depraved practice that was uh, 
done at the highest levels. In fact, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome was built on the sale of indulgences, okay? So um, Martin Luther was right in condemning that practice because it is opposed to the teachings of the Catholic Church and the canon law of the Church of that period, that you cannot sell sacraments, you cannot sell grace. Uh, these are things that are gifts. Um, so, so how that developed in the life of the church, the sale of them, is, is very questionable and very serious and, and very corrupt. And so in a sense I would say that God used Martin Luther and his uh, reformation, if you will, to get the leaders of the Catholic Church to look at the corrupt practices that had developed in terms of indulgences and their sales and maybe some superstition that also uh, was wrapped up in this, and other issues of reform that was needed uh, in the church at that time. So when I look at Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation, I don't see that as the devil necessarily causing that to happen, although in a sense we can say that because there was corruption in the Catholic Church, and corruption comes from evil, from Satan. But Martin Luther was used by God to bring a purification not to the Catholic Church. And, and then a counter-reformation took place. So in a sense, we can say that, that all of this was an action of grace, even uh, the division that took place at that time. Now, it's up to us now to pray for recovery of the unity that was lost and to work towards that. And, and in the last 50 years, there's been even a greater thrust in that regard from the Catholic Church and other Protestant communities. How that will pan out uh, before the Second Coming, I don't know. But things are better today in terms of Christian unity than they were 50 years ago, wouldn't you say? So that's an act of grace uh, in, in many ways. Um, our prayers also help the faithful departed by showing them love. And, you know, the second book of Maccabees in the Old Testament says that it is a worthy and noble thing to pray for those who have died with the view of the resurrection. For if we did not believe in the resurrection, what good would it do to pray for them in death? So that comes from the Old Testament. Uh, and so praying for the dead is a very important custom in the Catholic Church. And we especially pray for the dead on All Souls Day, which is November 2nd. And November in, in general is, is kind of dedicated to praying for the dead. But we should be praying for the dead all the time, which we do at Mass, if you'll notice, in the prayers of the faithful and even in the prayers, uh, the Eucharistic prayer, uh, we pray for those who have died. So every day the Church collectively, uh, through the Mass, prays for uh, the dead that they might be purified and enter into the fullness of heaven. Now, we want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, funerals in the Catholic Church. All Catholics have the right to the complete funeral services of the Church. And the complete funeral services, um, well, I would say that you should look at it in the broader sense. If you're living a sacramental life, certainly you want to be in a state of grace, going to confession regularly, receiving communion frequently, going to Mass every Sunday. If you're in the hospital and dying, you should call the priest for the anointing of the sick, the last rites, and even prayers after death in the hospital or at home, if possible. Then the church continues to pray for the dead person, the faithful departed, as we call them, uh, through the preparation of the body at the time of visitation, what we call the vigil for the deceased, which is a, a scripture service which could include the rosary. And it's normally a part of, of your visitation the night before the funeral, okay? And that's normally uh, celebrated or prayed in the funeral home. Uh, it used to be prayed in the family home, where, when bodies were brought back home uh, until the burial. So that's the first stage of the, the funeral liturgy, if you will, of the church. The, the vigil for the deceased the night before. But even prior to that, there are formal prayers for the family who gathers in the presence of the body for the first time, as well as the formal prayers right immediately after death. Uh, and those are very short prayers, and a priest or a deacon or a layperson could do that. Then the vigil for the de deceased could be led by a deacon or a priest, or if they're not available, uh, a suitable layperson could lead those. Then the day of the funeral, you would have the funeral mass. 
where all of the prayers are directed towards the person who has died as well as their loved ones who are present in terms of the comfort that is needed. And then we would take the body to the cemetery in procession. Now, in the, ideally, it would be nice to have a cemetery right next to us and we would walk to the cemetery for the burial, but most places now you have to drive, but you still go in a, a procession. So that's viewed as kind of a religious procession similar to the procession that we might have into the church and out of the church at the end of Mass. Uh, and then at the cemetery, the ground is blessed, if it's not already blessed or consecrated, and there is the committal of the body into the ground, and final prayers and the conclusion of the funeral Mass takes place at the cemetery. Um, so that's the full-blown funeral service of the Catholic Church. The preference of the Catholic Church is that the body be given a Christian burial. Okay? So we treat the human body, even in death, with dignity and respect. Okay? And that's why we send them to a mortician and, and the body is bathed and uh, may be embalmed. It's not required of the Catholic Church, but we certainly don't oppose that. You can put makeup on and make the body look alive, if you wish. Nice clothes. Uh, because all of that is a symbol of what? The resurrection of the glorified body. So I used to think, well, you know, death is horrible. We should not mask it. It's horrible. No. It is very appropriate to uh, do all of these things to comfort the grieving, to give them hope in the resurrection, and to treat the body which became a temple of the Holy Spirit through baptism in a respectful fashion. Okay? So all of these things are wonderful ways to show respect for the deceased. Okay. And then the burial of the body at a cemetery in consecrated or blessed uh, earth, or, or, or blessed grave, or, or an above ground tomb, if you wish, or a columbary, whatever. Not a columbary, but a, 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 an entombment. Uh, all of that is supposed to also be an image of the deceased waiting for the second coming and the resurrection of the body. So here on earth, you can point to various cemeteries and various people that are there who are awaiting the resurrection of the dead. Okay? So the cemetery itself becomes a sign of that which we hope for at the end of time. Awaiting, so to speak. Of, and, and then it's also a tangible place for loved ones to go and visit the dead, which the Catholic Church invites you to do. Uh, you should, most of us go to cemeteries, don't we? And I was, last Monday, I went to where my dad is buried uh, and, and visited there and said a prayer. And it's a very tangible uh, um, experience of kind of still being in touch with uh, the person that was important in your life or people, whoever. Uh, so, so that's very important. By way of exception, the church now allows for cremation. I have mixed feelings about this because that has opened the door to all kinds of problems that we never had with the burial of the body. And some weird practices uh, uh, that are, are creeping in because of that, that are not necessarily Christian. Uh, uh, so I, but, but it is allowed. But the church says that you then must treat the ashes of the deceased as you would the human body and give the ashes a proper Christian burial or entombment in an appropriate place. Now, I think we talked about this uh, recently. Uh, so so at the, for the vigil of the deceased, the night before, the ashes would be present there. We would, and that would be this tangible sign of the human person that is being uh, buried. At the funeral mass, the ashes would be treated as the casket is, or the body is. Uh, and then we would go to the cemetery or wherever it is where these will be entombed and uh, to await the resurrection of the body, uh, whether it's at a cemetery or a special place for ashes or whatever. Now, the church does not foresee that people would keep the ashes in their home uh, uh, or mix the ashes or or give parts of the ashes to loved ones or, and all of that. That's kind of something that, that was unanticipated when the church allowed for this. So the preference is the burial of the body, uh, ashes uh, by way of exception. It is permissible, but not the norm, for somebody to ask just for the graveside service, what we call the rite of committal. 
and they may not have a visit, they might choose not to have a visitation or the vigil for the deceased the night before. They may choose not to have a mass. Uh, they may choose not to have even a funeral home service. Uh, and so all I do is I meet them at the cemetery and I have a religious service at the cemetery, bless the ground and commit the body, okay? That is one choice, but it's not the best choice. Why not go the Cadillac route? But in certain situations, like let's say that the only surviving people uh, are not Catholic, they don't know what Catholicism is about, but they want to respect the wishes of their Catholic loved one, uh, they choose this abbreviated form. Or for whatever reason, they choose not to have a full Mass for the person. Let's say the person never went to Mass uh, uh, and is a Catholic and died. Well, maybe it would be better just to have a, a simple service in the funeral home chapel, which would be a scripture reading and, or in a homily and some singing. And then we go to the cemetery for the uh, deceased, uh, for the, the uh, committal. So there are some options, but to me it seems it's always wise for a Catholic to have a funeral mass because the mass prays for the deceased uh, that they would uh, enter into the fullness of heaven. So is there any question on any of the funeral things? Yes? Well, I didn't know if we were going to get to this. What about donating your body oh. to science? <laughs> Can you donate your body to science? Yes. Uh, uh, that's very common and it is allowed. And uh, most hospitals that are, are teaching institutions will dispose of the remains in an appropriate way. Usually they give a Christian burial to the remains. Uh, in Augusta, where uh, Dr. Mongan taught at the Medical College of Georgia, uh, when I, it, the, I was there 14 years as a priest, and I would say in that 14 years I probably <laughs> Uh, experience no more or, or no less than I should say, no less than five people actually g giving their bodies to the medical college. So what we did was we just had a mass for them and we acknowledged that that's what they did. Then the medical college every year, and I can't remember when it was, uh, would commit in a, at a cemetery the ashes of all those uh, that they were finished with and there would, the families would come for that and you'd have different clergy representing the different denominations that were there for a, 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 a ceremony of, of burial. So, so I found the medical college treated the, the, the corpses or the cadavers in a very respectful way. So that is, that is permissible. I guess the most uh, gory thing is like the body farms that you see where they take a body and put it in out in the field, you know. Yeah. No, that the church was the church would find that disrespectful. Okay. Now you might be able to help me better on this. There is a, a museum exhibit of the human bodies. Uh, what's that called? Body, body exhibit. Very good. That's what we understand, but I'm not sure what the church how the church feels about that. Because it's kind of an exhibitionism. Yeah, there's something there's there's something fascinating about it, but there's something untoward about it as well. Macabre, Macabre is the word, right? And and it's kind of the trivialization of death too uh, that's occurring in our society. And that's why I'm saying that people are doing weird things now that we never did before. Uh, in, in, not just in the church, but in society in general. I mean, um, I would say up until 10, 15 years ago, if you went to a funeral, you knew that you had to dress properly, okay? With a coat and tie and all the rest of that. Today, people are wearing shorts, uh, uh, shirt tails untucked, uh, it's 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 just it's just kind of a strange thing that's occurring um, that we we I guess when you lose faith in God and respect for God and respect for one another you don't take anything seriously so that that's maybe part of it I don't know the culture of death, the culture of death right right could that also be a lot that's what's been happening the last forty years where mm -hmm. a lot of these beliefs and the way people are looking at religion they say it doesn't make any difference God sees you for what you are right and some of that taking over and people losing respect not only for one another but for yeah there's something weird happened. going something weird going on there yeah look at the model that we have in the Bible in terms of the king 
care for Jesus. I mean, that, that to me is a lot in terms of careful wrapping and clothes and, you know, just because... Look what the Jews do to this day. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. It's, it, well, the Eastern Orthodox, what right. they do at the right. gravesite. No, right. I mean, they've got the incense and vestments and, the, you know, so... But, I mean, you know, one of the things that you, in terms of that, donating your body, how many people here have organ donation on there? Is organ donation okay? Yes, but I'll tell you what, I won't put it on my driver's license. Why? <laughs> because I don't trust the system. Okay. So if you knew who was taking it, you would have a different, you know, yeah. I would rely on my family. And, you know, there's pluses and minuses to that. Mm -hmm. I can tell you some stories. <laughs> well, of course, and you don't know, like, like in Augusta, the University Hospital Medical College of Georgia, you would have some sense that they're going to do things appropriately, right? Well, what would be, what would be inappropriate? The, the rush to declare somebody... Well, that, that um, yeah, sure. You know, <laughs> the organs. Right, right, right. You know? Now, the medical college, I, I had to... Uh, one of my parishioners worked with, with uh, family members whose loved ones were dying to ask them if they would donate uh, the body and or, or parts. Yeah. Thing to do. It's admirable, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. The thing is, is that... I don't want it just on a card. I want my family involved in that decision. Right. Mm -hmm. But even if it's on a card, ultimately it's your family has next to make the decision. Right. Right. decision. Right. Regardless of whether you put they yes or no, they, they can you know, still override. I mean, there are horror stories, and yes, they're small <laughs> numbers, but you know, and with time, I don't know. You know. Well, you know, happens, so. I have been in that situation. I guess you have as doctors as well where a young person that was critically injured and supposedly dead but was on a, a ventilator and they looked as alive as anybody and they're supposedly dead but they have them on the ventilator to preserve you know the, the body the question is well okay uh, at what point do you start harvesting the the uh, um, the organs and the eyes and all the rest of the skin and uh, so that would be a little bit of a worry I guess you know the whole issue of brain death mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's still some debate, but the church has pretty well accepted the, the standard criteria. The trouble is not everybody follows. It. Right, right. I mean, you know, so. Right, right. And the, the other issue in terms of death penalty, um, I don't know if you want to say that. Well, yeah, I did touch on it, I, mean, I didn't go into any detail. Uh, the Catholic Church does have a consistent ethic of life from the moment of conception until natural death, and that you should not do anything that would actively take someone's life. Um, however, in terms of the death penalty, the Church does recognize that the state has a right to protect society from criminals that are a threat to individuals and others in society. And within that context, in years gone by, the church also said that the state had the right to execute uh, those that were, were criminally insane or, or a threat to society or their crime was so heinous that it deserved this punishment. The church has been re-examining that position for the last 25 to 30 years, maybe a little bit longer. Pope John Paul II was opposed to the death penalty. But he did not raise that to, an ish, to a level of, of official teaching in the church. He said that society today has the means by which to incarcerate those who are criminal f until they die, uh, and therefore they no longer pose a threat to society. Okay? Whereas in the past, certain communities and cultures did not have the means to build prisons that were suitable uh, for protecting people, they could easily break out. Even in African yeah, places yeah, like that, that yeah. would be a burden. Right, right. You couldn't keep them in a Quonset hunt because, you know, they would escape. So you would have a right to execute within that kind of a context uh, if they were guilty. Um, but I would say, you know, some people say that, that opposing the death penalty is on the same level as opposing, opposing abortion, and it's not. Because in terms of abortion, we're talking about an innocent human life that has not had the uh, uh, privilege of being placed on trial before their life is taken. Um, so, there, and obviously the child is not guilty. Uh, so you can't kill an innocent human life, whether it's a baby or, or any innocent life after they're born. 
Um, but in a criminal situation, the church does have the door open to that possibility uh, for the protection and the common good of society. Mentioning that basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as a as a as a Catholic, I can be opposed to the death penalty. Uh, let's say as a as a lay person, but also as a priest, I could be opposed to the death penalty, and I could give it an argument to you as to why that should be the that we should oppose it. But I can't say to you as a Catholic priest that you must be opposed to the death penalty in order to be a good Catholic. I can't say that because that's not true. Uh, but I would ask you maybe to look at what we're saying about the consistency of... Be taken seriously. Seriously, correct, correct. And, and, and I would also say that, that anytime somebody's executed, that should be a cause of very... Uh, kind of a, uh, a sadness uh, that, that there was no other way to appropriately deal with this person. Um, because you know quite well that when there are executions in Jackson, is that where, where it occurs? That of course you have those that are opposed to the death penalty there, but then you have those that are having a party, uh, you know, and there's something wrong with that, I think. Uh, and the other reason why the church is opposed to the death penalty and would prefer um, um, life in prison, if you can do that, is that the possibility of conversion, that you always have hope for the person that's in prison that they could experience a conversion and a change of heart. And in fact, that does happen on death row, doesn't it? Uh, for and the, the the I have had a personal experience about this. I don't know if I've shared this, uh, but in Augusta, the year before I left to come here, I had the mother of a man come to me in January and said, "Father, I need to plan the funeral of my son." I said, "I'm sorry. I'm, when did he die?" She said, "Well, he's not dead." Uh, I said, well, "Oh, uh, well, when do you want to do the funeral?" She said, "Now this is in January. I'd like to do it April 25th." <laughs> So, I, and I was totally clueless as to what this was all. I said, oh gosh, this is one for my memoirs. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, well, her son had been on death row in South Carolina for 13 years and had committed a heinous crime. He killed three police officers, and he was a police officer, but he was high on drugs and a variety of other things, and uh, was sentenced to death and um, was on death row in Columbia, South Carolina. But soon after that, uh, in his time in prison, he changed. I mean, he had a conversion experience. He was a practicing Catholic in prison, helped with the chaplain, the Catholic chaplain there. Uh, and they went through all kinds of processes to uh, uh, see if they could overturn the death penalty thing, but they didn't. So basically, the man that was executed 13 years after his crime was not the same man that committed the crime. And that was really kind of, kind of eye-opening to me. And in addition to that, the, the, family of, uh, of the families of the victims were opposed to him being put to death. Okay? And in fact, at the funeral mass, he was put to death, at the funeral mass, we prayed for the victims publicly at his funeral mass. So... Uh, so, you, you know, those kinds of things are kind of uh, sad in some ways. Any questions before we go to the, uh, um, anything about the funeral, Catholic funeral? Yes? I can just follow up on that. So a Catholic could be in favor or support the death penalty if it's necessary to protect Correct, society. correct. What about uh, some people feel that, for the argument, just as a general sense of justice? Well, I think that too. You could see that as uh, a part of justice. And the church has seen that as well. But Pope John Paul II has caused us in his teachings to question that part of it. But that it should, be for should not be for vengeance, correct. Should not be for vengeance. But, yeah. but people who, uh, if it's not necessary to protect, Catholics could still, could they still legitimately have it. Uh, right, and see, in my sense, my, my, see, I, 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 I grapple with this too because there is a sense of, of you really feel like, well, justice was served in some people being put to death. Um, but I also say, well, you know, life imprisonment without chance of parole is cruel, too, in a sense, you know. Uh, it could be even worse, a fate worse than death for some of these people. And, I mean, you've seen TV documentaries of what prison life is like. That's why he decided to be born again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I actually feel, after they've been in prison a while, they decide 
Yeah. Yeah. But prison's a horrible experience, you know. Right. Well, we don't know. That's why. That's why I would say definitely you would have to have life imprisonment without the chance of parole. So that would be justice too, uh, even the darker side of that. Uh, but so so it's a very complex thing, you know. Um, um, One of the other issues mm -hmm. is the fact. That, I mean, the truth is that the death penalty has not been applied in a just way. Correct. That's the other and thing. that's yeah. part of the reason in terms of... If you have money and all the rest of it, you can probably get off. Uh, you know, so but if you don't, you have know, a good lawyer and all the rest of that... Minority, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. So that's one of the arguments in terms of it's not been applied justly. All right. Uh, getting back to the funerals. and Now, uh, yes, yes. Um, Rose Hill Cemetery, there's a separate Catholic section, yes. a separate Jewish section. Yes. Is, is there anything like that in town anymore? It no, it's not required any longer. It used to be that uh, if there was a Catholic cemetery, Catholics should choose the Catholic cemetery. Uh, kind of like the Jews wanting their own location as well. But because it's, it's hard for churches to run Catholic cemeteries now, we have one in Savannah though, uh, but that's the, well, well, and besides Macon, Macon's is full, uh, so we did have one here. Uh, we prefer to let secular um, corporations take care of this. I'll yes. Put a plug for yeah. Has a natural, whatever. I you know I don't know all the details mm -hmm. of that, but the Conyers mm -hmm. Monastery has land set aside mm -hmm. for just natural burial. Right. Now, now the other thing that you should keep in mind, those of you who are converting or becoming Catholic who will not have any family members who are Catholic. You need to make it very clear to them what your funeral arrangements are going to be. Okay? Don't take it for granted that they're going to give you a Catholic burial if they're not Catholic. Uh, or, and especially if they resent the fact that you're becoming Catholic, don't take for granted that you're going to get a Catholic burial. So make sure in your plans, either at the, at the funeral home or whatever it is, that your wishes are very clear, okay? Because I can tell you in the 30 years that I've been a priest, many a Catholic have received a Baptist funeral because their family members refused a Catholic uh, funeral for their loved one. And I knew full well that the Catholic who died wanted a Catholic funeral, but they are, their, their wishes were not respected. So just be aware of that and that you should have some sort of, and the church has no control. I mean, once you die, uh, whoever is in charge of you has the control. So, so just be aware of that, okay? Okay. So, yes? If, uh, I mean, if somebody commits suicide, I mean, if they're a Catholic, then you still give them that's a good question. Can you have a Catholic burial if you committed a suicide? Up until about 1965, no. You could not have a Catholic burial or funeral if you committed suicide, which was horrible. You know, it was just absolutely horrible uh, because the family then was made to suffer even more. It was one thing that the person committed suicide, then the church was kind of turning their back on, on the family and, and their loved one. So the church changed that uh, around 1965 and, and it is quite common now for, for, for uh, those who have committed suicide to receive a Catholic burial. Because of, of the church's more openness to the psychological factors that could have uh, mitigated the full consent of the will. So what we do now is we uh, err on the side of, of mercy and and the, pres the hope that the person really wasn't a full participant in, in this decision. Yes? Yeah, you know, I think that's a good example in terms of how the dogma hasn't really changed in terms of the, t the understanding in terms of if you willingly kill yourself and you have all those three points, then you've committed a moral sin and you doomed yourself. Right. But the, what, in terms of the church's practice changing, right. in terms of a better understanding, a pastoral of approach, all, yeah, and yeah, all the things yeah. That are involved in now, not I have done funerals, beautiful funerals for people that have died. In fact, here a few, maybe last year, I think it was, a young man, maybe in his early twenties, uh, who was very popular with younger people, committed suicide, and we did a beautiful funeral for him. And I saw all these young people there thinking, gosh, this is how I could go out in the blaze of glory. So in my homily, I made it clear that what he did was wrong. Uh, and that uh, it was a very selfish act on his part. 
and that it had ramifications for his parents who are now suffering and his loved ones who are suffering. So, and, and I was criticized by some who attended that funeral that I made that so clear. Uh, but I just felt in good conscience I had to because the funeral service was so beautiful uh, um, in terms of the music and what we did, the ritual and all of that. I thought, I didn't want to give anybody out there the thought that this is uh, a good thing that's happened because it wasn't, you know. So, so I, I, had, I felt like I had a responsibility to the young people that were there as well as the others uh, to make it clear that this was wrong. And the parents of the child thanked me afterwards, but there were some others. I think, Jim, you said there were somebody that said something about that, because you were there, weren't you? Uh, what did they say? I mean, it was like, what was their attitude about that? Just their whole attitude that, you know, like you, you didn't have mercy, you know, and stuff. And mm -hmm. I was just telling Cerise that basically, you know, it's the mm -hmm. people, you know, the old adage of uh, Jack Nicholson said, <laughs> right, right, right. And, and, and it wasn't that I wasn't being merciful. I was, we were commending him to God's mercy. But I wanted to make extremely clear that suicide is a serious sin. And, and I had to do it in that context, I thought. You know, so. Okay. So if you take time now to do your discussions, and uh, we'll wrap things up. Uh, yes. point about the, the funeral liturgy itself. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't permit the... Uh, the casket covered with the flag, for instance. Right, the flag is taken off at the doors of the church. Right, it's covered with a pall, pall. the symbol of your baptismal garment, I guess. Correct. And uh, we, don't, we don't permit uh, eulogies. We do, in one sense, uh, the homily, technically, given by the priest or the deacon should not be a eulogy. It should be a, a homily based upon uh, resurrection. resurrection and all that. But then after communion, family members it depends on the priest whether or not they permit it, can allow family members to, to give a, a, a reflection on the person uh, that's more about their life. Yeah. Okay. But the priest normally doesn't... Now, I will bring things into my homily about the person's life, but my focus is not so much on the person as to what, as what God is doing for the person. Okay. All right. Very good.